be a, not to be a faceless <laughs> bureaucrat. And interesting to say that I'm probably the most bureaucrat you can have because all my career was on the commission when I came when I was 24. So more bureaucrat than me, you will not find. Uh, but having said that, I'm extremely happy to be here, to be here with you. I have been a lot in Ireland uh, during my past capacity, which is employment and social affairs. I have been a bit less since I have been dealing for uh, uh, education and culture. I'm a lot, again, we had an interesting conference three days before the referendum on, uh, on education. We have one uh, tomorrow, so I think also the interaction is, is, is uh, becoming very strong. <coughs> if I take two, two seconds, my, my past capacity, I must say that I have always been very struck when I came to, to Ireland with the transformation that you had achieved. Uh, I have been responsible, for example, for the European Social Fund, and it's very clear that a lot of your achievements have been through a very good use of the European Social Fund, and you were all always quoting Ireland, especially Italy, the new member states, on the way your investment in innovation, in research, and in education was. At the same time, you have been able to do the link between the EU and the US. I'm just coming back from the, from the US. And, and the mixture you had on using the structural funds that are being able to attract foreign direct investment, I think was, was a very important thing. Of course, in between, the crisis has happened and it has hit Ireland in particular. And we all know that the world will not be the same afterwards. Nevertheless, I think that in Ireland, the ingredients for a successful world generation, this openness to new ideas, to creativity and innovation, are already firmly present. So in giving you a, a European perspective on culture, creativity and innovation, let me start at the bottom of the graph. With the crisis, what Richard Florida has named the Global Reset, we are questioning the foundations of our models of growth and our economies. We are searching out new paradigms for sustainable growth. It's too bleak to call the crisis an opportunity, of course. Too many people are suffering too much hardship for that. But if we are to start reimagining our world, I think we could do very well to start from my own area, which is culture and education. You probably know the apocryphal quote attributed to Jean Monnet. If I were to start Europe all over again, I would start with culture. Not true, of course. The EU's founder deliberately chose to build the European project on tangible economic links, trade links, to replace the rebel of the Second World War with a common market in stone and coal. But the very fact that people think he said it is interesting. It points to an understanding that culture is somehow intrinsic to the European project, but that we have not yet given it the room it needs to grow. This is why we need to go beyond an economic or simply political conception of Europe if we are to create the conditions in which the European project would succeed. I'm sure you have plenty of insights into this with the Lisbon Treaty referendum just a couple of weeks behind us. But to my mind, and more important, to President Barroso's mind, culture is more important than economic policies. He repeated that very recently. And also, it's going beyond the political institutions for building Europe. Not only because culture is an economic force, which I've been discussing today, but also it's a force for political change. Not because culture is a constant by which we define ourselves, culture can help us root our identities as individuals and as Europeans in today's shifting interconnected world. The European Union motto, Unity and Diversity, is familiar, of course. But it's no less true for that. The strength of the EU is not that we must be all the same in order to be Europeans, but that we are a community of values, a community of cultures, with respect for diversity and building on diversity as its heart. European integration is a collective of institutions, of ideas, of customs, of languages, of memories, and of projects for the future, which draw Europeans together, which provide the foundations on which to build the shared European project. But the construction to succeed 
cannot only be built by policymakers. It needs the full involvement of civil society. The debate on how to close the gap with citizens continues. How to involve people so they feel a full part of this shared enterprise. Will European may have won the minds of its people, it still needs to win the hearts. Can culture help? As I said in the Commission's opinion, yes. European culture is the sum of many parts, an accretion of artistic, creative, and intellectual impulses, drawing on our different heritages, histories, languages, and our literary, artistic, and popular traditions. And what is more, this cultural diversity is a well of opportunity from which we can draw to achieve many of Europe's aims, greater solidarity, greater prosperity, and building peaceful, respectful relations with the rest of the world. I was talking in China recently to discuss about exchange for universities and the attractiveness of, uh, of the European higher education area. And the Chinese, who, as you know, go very much to, to US universities, were beginning to want to change the pattern because they saw Europe as the only place to go for diversity. To go for diversity of languages, to then of markets as well. And then, for example, with the programs we have worldwide, like, like Erasmus Mundus, they see it as an opportunity because Chinese students can go to two universities. They can go to, to Trinity College and they can go to the Barcelona University. And they will learn two different ways of teaching, two different systems of education, and two different languages as well. So I think diversity, if it's dealt with properly, is an asset, including vis-a-vis -vis our friends from America. The spirit of exchange has shaped European values. Europe's evolution through the ages has been a cultural evolution, fashioned through the free exchange of ideas, not only across space, but across time, as each era has placed the values and achievements of the previous generations under the microscope. Today, Europeans are grafted onto many different routes, based on many different peoples and cultures that came before us. And since we are here, in North Great George Street, perhaps we can draw from the work of James Joyce to illustrate these last two points. Not only did Joyce have the temerity to tell Yeats, I've made you too late, you are too old for me to help you, he took the further liberty of grafting modernism onto the achievements of the Celtic revival. And in order to complete this half-ironic mission of forging the uncreated conscience of my race, Joyce rooted around for what suited him for yet rag and bone shop of the heart while discarding the rest. And to embody this uncreated conscience, he chose the Jewish Leopold Bloom, humanist every man of Ulysses. So we know too many liberties with Joyce, you know much better than me. His work tells us that European identity is not based on territories or ethnicity, but on shared values and culture, openness, tolerance, and respect for human dignity. And by the way, last year, with the European Year of Intercultural Dialogue, both internally in the EU and between the EU and the rest of the world. And this is in this context that we have set out to give culture, creativity, and innovation a bigger profile on the European stage. We believe about we have got there, as I would rather take up the time by looking ahead. But I think it's important to say that we had for the first time ever a European agenda for culture, which was agreed by the heads of state and government at the end of 2007, which has brought together civil society, cultural organizations, the member states, and the European institutions around a set of shared priorities. In fact, we used to do that what is the, the, the method of the, of the Lisbon strategy, the so-called open method of coordination. We fix common objectives, we fix targets, and member states implement these common objectives in their own diverse way, and we provide for exchange of experiences, peer learning, and exchange of good practice. And this agenda is based on three big uh, elements. One is promoting cultural diversity and intercultural dialogue, the second, which I will go more in detail, is promoting culture as a catalyst for creativity, the economic role of culture, and promoting culture in our international relations. 
So I will now focus on culture as a catalyst for creativity, looking in particular at the creative industries, we will hear a lot later, at the European year on creativity and innovation, and at how to turn around education so that we liberate rather than limit creativity. The crisis has showed us that our future has to be built on different foundations from the past, and that the only secure base is our knowledge, skills, and creativity. A country's wealth is no longer based on making things. We are moving to the experiential economy. Even back in 2003, the cultural sector generated most of Europe's GDPs that did real estate or the food trading and tobacco industries or car industries, 2.6% of GDP. The cultural industries are sparkling handling change in all sorts of directions. Creative communities whose raw material with their capacity to imagine, create and innovate, and replacing production lines and bringing down the demarcation between technology, culture, business, profit and non-profit sectors. Because culture and the creativity it generates can provide innovative solutions in many different settings. Not just in the obvious areas of design, which is a, a clear area for, for, for combining all these elements, but also architecture, entertainment, but also in business, to motivate staff or to uncover their creativity or in delivering services such as healthcare and of course lifelong learning. Culture is a prime mover in regional development and urban regeneration. It's interesting to see, by the way, how the European capitals of culture have been in some cases a good basis for regenerating an area for regenerating a city. I mean, we have two very interesting examples, which are Glasgow in the UK and Lille in France, which coming from deprived areas are now really cities of the future. So again, around culture and cultural resources, <coughs> regeneration of territories can take place. Cultural industries are also changing how we work, moving away from top-down business models towards networks and partnerships. They are at the forefront of a skills revolution which values soft skills such as creativity, teamwork, initiative taking, language and communication skills, which business is looking more and more for, together, of course, with the technical skills which are needed. Artists and creative people not only enrich us with their creativity, they help us understand ourselves and the world around us better. They provide an antidote to the mistrust <coughs> of the other that recession or crisis can engender. Even better, they are not afraid to question the existing social order and can point to the new models suitable for a world post-crisis. Nonetheless, the impression still lingers that culture is a luxury or a cost rather than being an investment for Europe's future. So as part of our cultural agenda, we are working with member states and with civil society, with the civil society platform, on boosting the profile of the creative industries in Europe. Next year, we will bring out a green paper on strategies for improving their competitiveness and building better links with other sectors of the economy. We have a double goal, stimulate a Europe-wide discussion on how to provide a supportive, creative environment, and for our part, to ensure that EU programs and policies which impact on cultural and creative industries are better suited to their needs. These are also the arguments that spurred us into nominating 2009 the European Year of Creativity and Innovation. What we wanted by putting creativity and innovation together was to put together in synergy and in interaction two worlds which don't always talk to each other, which is the business world and the cultural world, and to see how they can interact for the benefit of innovation and creativity. And we wanted to raise the profile of Europe's cultural and creative industry, to encourage a new, more open mindset in tune with the more fluid realities of the knowledge society, where technology and the arts are no longer partitioned off from each other, but create innovation through their interplay. To tell the member states thinking strategically about how to revamp education and to open it up to culture, creativity and innovation. And to appeal the creativity of each one of European citizens. 
I feel that we have heard the side guys with involvement from the creative industries and from the cultural sector and genuine interest from the member states. We have several groups under the uh, cultural agenda and the one which works the best is the one about creative industries. Ireland, I know, is fully attuned to the innovation agenda. And I know that big discussion and a special group about the future of innovation in Ireland. This is another facet of your successful transformation as innovation has helped you move your output right up to the value chain. In order to raise awareness of the European year, we have appointed a group of European ambassadors for creativity and innovation. They will, by the way, give President Barroso in November a manifesto about the future European policy on creativity and, and, and innovation. And it's interesting because these people, 23 people, range from the vice president of Microsoft to a dancer in Belgium, uh, Anna Teresa de, de Gersmaker, the former prime minister of Finland, Esko Hau, is, is, is there as well. And from Ireland, we have Damini Kumar, who is uh, based in, in Minos University. And it's very interesting because when you pull all these people together, starting from very different angles, when you have musicians, when you have business people, when you have academics together, it makes a very interesting mix which is exactly what we want, which is how, from their different points of view, they can build this relation between innovation and creativity. And one of the first things that the Barroso II Commission, whenever it comes into force, will do is to present an innovation strategic agenda. That will be one of our main points. So we very much hope that this ambassador's uh, contribution will be very important. And one of our key flagship which was also very dear to the President of the Commission, which we have now launched, the European Institute of Innovation and Technology, uh, which is based on partnership between business, uh, universities, and, and research, uh, which is now just coming, coming into real practical, practical work, is a good symbol of that as well. Which brings me to my final point, which is the importance of revamping education so that it helps and not hinders creativity. Creativity is often associated with talent, spontaneity, or coincidence, factors that apparently cannot be influenced, but ultimately at led to chance. Interestingly enough, coming from Stanford and Silicon Valley, that's exactly what they did. Just nice individual initiative from somebody, a researcher, who goes to some industry and, 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 and gets some support from them, and then it can become Google. So it's exactly what the Americans did. Research also reveals that although luck and chance do count, so does education, which is exactly the point about the US. The arts can provide many of the right learning conditions. Teamwork, exchange with people of all different backgrounds, interdisciplinary learning with a special focus on arts education, and a risk-taking culture that tolerates and even acknowledges failure for its value as experiment and in pushing boundaries. This is why we are encouraging new models, for example, partnership with cultural operators, to all schools and universities to develop creative resources and tap into the new skills at work in the cultural sector. And tomorrow, here in Dublin, we will have our forum and business university partnership, which is an important component on that as well. And our initiative, New Skills for New Job, which is how to better forecast the skills which will be needed for the job of the future, is also part of this general agenda. Mm -hmm. Our cultural agenda experts are examining now how to develop children's creativity, innovation, and intercultural skills, looking at schools' curricula and at the role of informal and non-formal learning, including cooperation between schools, cultural organizations, businesses, artists, and parents. So in conclusion, we often talk in the EU about the importance of bringing down borders. But we have moved beyond the physical borders to tackling the invisible ones, those that keep art and technology apart, or separate education from creativity, or even those that separate people into them and us. As we face a world in flux, this is one of the most important lessons we can learn from culture and the arts with their immense potential capacity. We need to bring down these traditional barriers if we are to unlock Europe's potential to innovate and to think and act creatively. I want to finish with a real quote.
from Germany this time. What stops us, he said, is fear for change. And yet, it's on change that our well-being depends. Europe has always been able to adapt, able to evolve, able to surmount challenges like the last ones you experienced. Europe will continue to change in a changing world. Our diversity, our ability to use that diversity to generate a creative spark and bring innovative thinking to fruition will guarantee success. So I thank you for your attention and I'm ready to respond to your criticism. Thank you very much, um, and uh, <clears throat> thank you for inviting me. I, this is uh, I, it's the first time I've been on one of these occasions. First time I've been in this wonderful house. So thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> I, I, all I really know about what um, uh, I was expected today was the title "Creative Creativity and Innovation: The European Perspective." So <clears throat> I took it that I should go with "Creativity and Innovation: The Irish Perspective," which. <laughs> um, <laughs> which is, you know, in the next 20 minutes is a proposition I'm going to put to the test. So, um, I suppose uh, creativity, well, I'll start with first, you know, I think in general, it's one of those things, you, you know when you see it, um, we know it's, and innovation, it's very important uh, in terms of social, in terms of economic change, and change for the better, I think, associated with that. And we link it very much with <clears throat> art and culture. In many ways, it's a sine qua non in that world. So, <clears throat> I, um, I also we had we had an economic forum here very recently in family where a lot of people from around the world who have connections with that were invited to discuss what if you like what could be done <laughs> um, and <clears throat> it was interesting because one of the um, things that came out of that was this whole idea that uh, if you like culture uh, and, and sort of our, our culture could have a great uh, sort of indirect impact in terms of promoting Ireland, brand Ireland, if you like. Uh, and was, there were some artists there at the, um, at the meeting, and it was interesting that, a particularly good comment from one who said that, you know, as this was an economic forum, he, 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 he would have expected in the past to be invited to provide the entertainment, um, <laughs> not to participate and be part of a real discussion. Um, and of course there is a paradox, because branding is about, um, you know, there, it's a discipline. It's about a consistent, you know, it's about a core proposition. It's about a sort of a consistent communication, and it's about long-term planning. And none of these are really about art. So, <clears throat> there is, if, if, you, if you're setting out to plan, how, how do planners go around, if you like, bottling creativity and innovation and somehow fostering it so that it can do good? Um, it is quite a difficult thing to do. Artists are a bit like anarchists, you know, who are an organisation that more or less made up of people who disapprove of the principle of organisation. So, in that way, I thought I'd like to sort of switch now to something I actually know a little bit about, which is the film board. Because the <clears throat> film industry is, is, is the only part of the art which calls itself an industry. And that's because, I suppose, to make a film, you need resources on an industrial scale. It's just simply not easy or cheap, even in today's world, to make um, film that cheaply. So, uh, I think, um, in terms of the sort of film and part of the broader creative in industries. Um, I'd like to give an example of the film board as, to, as ways in which perhaps we can develop these qualities and have them kind of make a difference. Um, and I thought I'd like to start off, because when I joined the film board, um, as, as on the board, I mean, it's one of these things you, you know, get invited to do, and I didn't know too much about it before. And I brought two documents with me, which I think say a lot about how change can happen. The first one, which I read early on is the report of the Film Industry Committee. And this is a document you won't find anywhere because it was published in 1968. And it was chaired by John Houston. And <clears throat> Ireland is probably the last country in Europe that woke up to the idea of having a film industry. Um, <clears throat> the first piece of legislation was actually in 1980. And most other European countries would have had a film industry and recognized its value long before then. But the conclusions of this report said, and I've always found this inspirational because I think it still defines what we're here to do. It said that <clears throat> the difficulties in the way of establishment of an Irish feature film industry are formidable, but the benefits likely to accrue are sufficient to warrant the effort. So we're 40 years on from now, and it said these benefits would include the development and employment of Irish creative, artistic, and technical skills, the opportunity for Irish cinema audiences to see themselves and their way of life reflected on the screen, and the projection abroad of a true image of Ireland and the Irish way of life and traditions. 
and it said, the present policy of welcoming foreign filmmakers to Ireland should be continued and even extended, but the agency would have failed if its efforts lead merely to the establishment here of branches of international film companies, producing films that have not a significant Irish creative, artistic and technical content. It will have achieved success when Irish creative endeavour, technical ability and artistic talent are combined in making on a continuing basis films of a quality and a standard acceptable to audiences in Ireland and throughout the world. Uh, I, I feel that's a perfect definition of our purpose and what we're still doing 40 years later. And the other document I brought along is a survey that we commissioned in the Irish Film Board, which was published in December 2008. And this is the Irish Audiovisual Content Production Sector Review. It does not quite, the language isn't as good, I can tell you, as, as, as it was in 1968. But <clears throat> it says, overall sector report headlines, the value of the audiovisual content production sector in Ireland is valued at 557.3 million euro, 0.3% of gross domestic product, of which the independent sector represents 67. A sector employing 7,000 individuals, 85% in the independent sector, an estimated 567 companies operate within the sector. <clears throat> now that, so in 40 years, if you want a sort of factual description of what has taken place, these two documents I think describe it perfectly. We started from, a, from virtually a zero stance, so there were no feature films to be made, and we now have a sector which, just to put it in perspective, is the same size, scale and value <clears throat> as the entire Irish marine sector. So, <clears throat> And, and we, we look on this and we, we recognise that it is very much a domestic industry. So <clears throat> what, what we, the board, what we're now engaged in is a, a strategic review and we're asking ourselves how can we, if this is the size of the sector today and it's involved in making, and we describe all forms, not just film, film at the heart, but everybody working in film these days works across sort of boundaries. They make television, they might make commercials, they make a whole range of different audiovisual um, material. Um, so we're, we're now working on a program to say how can we, uh, if you like, develop this sector which is really a domestic sector made up of a lot of small companies. And I'd like to refer back to what you said because I think the business model of the film industry is quite an interesting one and other sectors are now looking at it. It's a sector which is essentially, it's a question of whether you think this is a strength or a weakness. It's a lot of small companies, it's fragmented, most of the people who work in it are self-employed. Uh, you can, on the one hand, you can say, well, that doesn't add up to very much. Um, or, on the other hand, you can say it's a very efficient way to produce because essentially you only spend the money when you're actually working and needing it. And it means that everything is organized around projects rather than establishments. That means you have a constant flow of creative, uh, if you like, different people working in different groupings, which is very stimulating in the creative production environment. So <clears throat> I think there is a lot to be said for the, if you like, the film industry business model. Uh, the other thing about film, is that it can only be made through international co-production. So it forces filmmakers to be both creative and innovative when it comes to raising the money. Um, and again, I think there's some very interesting kind of lessons in terms of how you put a film together. And increasingly, Irish filmmakers do, co do multiple co-productions with European countries uh, and with, um, uh, so because essentially to make a film you have to have pre-sales or you have to have partners. And it's a much more sophisticated arrangement now because everybody recognises that you don't want to make a creatively um, mixed film. You want the inspiration uh, and the intention of the author, of the filmmaker, to be what makes the film. Uh, so you don't want to compromise the filmmaker's um, integrity by insisting that if, if there's a Danish, uh, French, Irish, UK co-production, that's sort of got to have a little bit for everybody in the script. You don't, that's not the approach anymore. You, you back the film, but everybody, if you like, can come together to make a film. And then what you do is somebody else's film comes along and, and we help a little bit with that film. So we call it a creative co-production process where we don't try to editorially um, impose, we try to partner so that we can help uh, make other film, other people's films so that they will help us make our films. <coughs> um, in terms of, of a sort of, I suppose, how this all happens, because um, if, if you, if you, if you're, if you're, again, if you're, I suppose the film board's a development agency, so our job is to try and develop this sector. And we, we have two words which constantly guide what we do, one of which is talent, and one of which is enterprise. And they're more or less, I think, quite close to creativity and innovation. Talent is, if you like, um, the currency, really, of the entertainment business. It's what, it's what um, creates the compelling work, and that is what attracts audiences. 
So <clears throat> how do you, well you can't sort of plan it, you know, you can't train talent, but you can create an environment which, which allows people with a talent to develop themselves and to develop the confidence and also the knowledge and the skills and put them in contact with what you know is best practice in the areas that they're interested in. So it's about creating an environment whereby people with talent can develop their skills to a recognised, um, you know, as good as anywhere in the world level. Um, and in what we, so we do actually take a view that the film board, although it was, I mean, as an agency we have, or 88% of our funding goes directly back, back out to the industry in terms of direct funding. So we're quite efficient that way. It's a small organisation, and because the whole industry is based around projects, we try to support programmes which logically back either the talent agenda or the enterprise. The enterprise agenda is about finding people, so in the world, in the world of sort of show business, say, that you know, can exploit the talent. And, but I mean that in a good way, because in order to be able to make a film, for example, you have to have somebody who can raise the money. And <clears throat> ideally, if you are the author, then you have, you, you know, you have ownership of the idea and you have ownership of what's being produced. You want to be with somebody who can help you uh, to retain value in what you've created, so that you're not just giving it away, uh, if you like, for nothing. Um, uh, our, Irish filmmaking is, is very much a work in progress. We're, we're, we've a long way to go. We started late in the day. But I think uh, you know, these two documents demonstrate that real and substantial progress has been made. And <clears throat> I suppose the other thing about developing enterprise and developing talent is you have to be prepared to make mistakes. People are only going to learn from mistakes, and, and people shouldn't be criticised for making what others, what, like a bad critical review or a bad, you know, or something that isn't that great. The important thing is to, is to, uh, is to as much as possible, get people out there making films, um, or making programmes, or making work that they want to do. <coughs> and out of that will come the quality. And out of that will be events which will feed into, um, I suppose, what can be seen, if you go back to the family analogy, as uh, well, Irish creative and artistic and cultural um, output having some kind of uh, benefit. Uh, I believe it absolutely does have a benefit. I think we all know that you know, the cultural uh, and the economic sides of filmmaking are also provide work which has a real ambassadorial um, sort of influence for us. Um, but you can't make it happen. That, I suppose that's what I'm trying to say. You can by having a film industry, by backing it, and by kind of promoting it in a way that makes it sustainable and viable long term in terms of the economy as well as in terms of the integrity of the work, you do you do foresee films, and it is happening again and again. With mean, the last film that we had, which cost which had a budget of two hundred thousand euro, which uh, it was well known locally, it was called Once, um, and it it got an Oscar for the music. Uh, that, that, that means that two billion people have seen a film, um, or at least heard the music from a film, um, but it's about contemporary Dublin life. Um, it's about immigration and it's about, if, if anybody's seen it, it's a very, it's a small story, uh, but it just captured the imagination. And, and film does have that reach and impact globally that very few other things do. I mean, to put it again in perspective, the cost of making that film was about the same as an episode of The Clinic. So you have to be prepared to accept sort of hits and misses in this this world, and just because things aren't always good all the time, doesn't mean the project is, is bad. And I, I, that was, um, I don't know if that's relevant really to what we were saying, but um, I, I thought that um, that was sort of just a little description. I, 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 um, I mean, I could tell you more about the kind of programs we do and how we actually, uh, how we kind of support uh, careers as much as possible because to develop a career in filmmaking or if you want to be a filmmaker and there is such a wide range of skills needed in making films. There's, there's some people who are attracted to crafts. I came into it, I used to be a film editor. Other people want to be directors, they have they want to, they want to be writers, etc, etc. It's a very collaborative process. You need to, you're always putting teams of people together. Often you could, and one of the great things about why it's great actually kind of business or career or whatever you want to call it is because you don't get bored, you're always put together in a different configuration, you always come together around a different project. And, and I would say that if we can, um, um, I suppose I would say that there's, there is a bit of context here, which is, uh, when I look at that progress, it, it, it has relied, it does rely on government support for the film board, which more or less has been constant. Uh, there, in our current situation, there is a question as to whether the film board will continue or not. Um, film board is just a way of organising uh, supporting something. Uh, if, if it turns out to be a different way of supporting, 
uh, that's not the most important thing. The really important thing is that the sector itself is maintained. I do think that everybody who's described in that survey that we did, which was done <coughs> independently and objectively, um, uh, is, is an asset that has real potential for the future. So, um, and I think sometimes there's a time lag between sort of policy at one end, where I think there is an image of the film industry which is probably about 20 years out of date, as opposed to what's really going on for most people who work in the film today, which is really a, a very dynamic business that has real growth potential and does attract very high caliber people. We have about 500 students who come out of the colleges every year who come from courses related to film or media or, 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 or who want to work in, in one branch or other of the audiovisual sector. And um, my hope and I think belief is that that won't be enough. Thank you.